Hello and welcome to this week's uh, uh, episode of Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis. This is an open forum webinar for pharmacists sponsored by the American Pharmacists Association and we are really glad that you've joined us today. I'm Michael Hogue. I'm the Dean and Professor of Pharmacy at Loma Linda University and I'm the current president of the American Pharmacists Association. Uh, we have a great show planned for you today, uh, hopefully chock full of lots of information that will bring you up to speed on what we're core and central about as pharmacists, and that is uh, the medications. So we're going to discuss the very latest information on medications that are being used and look a little bit into those that are under uh, research currently for COVID-19, both prevention and for treatment. Now, our uh, speaker today is no stranger to all of you who join us on a weekly basis, Dr. Dan Slott, our Vice President for Professional Education Resources at APHA. Uh, Dan has a 10-year uh, background in working with the National Institutes of Health uh, in oncology and immunology and is an oncology board certified oncology specialist. Uh, he is our clinical expert and has prepared for you all today some great information that he'll be sharing with you as we go through the program. Uh, as we get into our question and answer time today, we'll also be joined by two other uh, familiar faces to you. First of all, Mitch Rothholz, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at APHA. And as many of you know, Mitch has been a longtime champion and advocate for pharmacy-based immunization services and the role pharmacists place in immunizations. So as you have questions today, perhaps about the new CDC recommendations uh, related to pharmacists resuming uh, at immunization programs within their pharmacies, Mitch will be the person who we will turn to to respond to your questions about that. And also we have Elisa Bernstein, our, our vice, Senior Vice President for Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs at APHA. And as you all know, Elisa came to APHA with 30 years of experience with the FDA. So we have some great expertise today and we want to encourage you to ask your questions. In fact, on the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, which is on the right of your screen, you will notice that there is a question or chat box there. You can enter your questions in as you think of them. We ask that you go ahead and do that as questions come to your mind, or even if you have questions on your mind now about drug therapies as Dan's beginning to talk, go ahead and enter those in. Uh, we will make sure that we get to those questions. Uh, if you would like to ask your question uh, verbally, that's what we're going to assume, that you would like to be able to do that, uh, then be sure now to enter your audio PIN if you're connected by a telephone, a cell phone or a landline phone. You'll need to enter your audio PIN into the phone now so that the staff can then unmute your line when I call on you to be able to ask your question. If today you are uh, connecting with the webinar and don't have audio, but you do have a question, you just simply need to write in your question, no audio, and I'll ask your question on your behalf as we get into the program. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available after, <clears throat> after today's webinar at pharmacist.com in the COVID-19 resources section. So you can access the webinar at that point and share it with your friends as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a little frog in my throat this morning. So for today's webinar, we'll have a brief presentation from Dan Slott sharing these key pieces of information about uh, current and emerging medications related to COVID-19. And then we're going to use the remainder of our time to take your questions. I will tell you that we've gotten quite a long list of questions in advance of today's webinar. So we'll be managing those questions and working them into the presentations in addition to taking your live questions today. Again, lots of information being shared. And also a reminder, you can ask questions about anything related to COVID-19. It does not have to just simply be about the medications. Uh, our staff are available to be able to answer all of your questions, whether it's about regulatory issues, legal issues related to COVID, uh, practice-based issues, and so forth. We'll do our best to answer every question that we can in the time that we have allotted. Uh, 
So with that, I believe we've covered everything I want to, oh, one last thing, as you'll notice, there's also a handouts tab. Today's slides are available for download at the handouts tab, and also those will also be posted at pharmacist.com for you to be able to download later. Okay, without any further ado, I'd like to invite Dan Zlot to join us uh, on video. And um, Dan, the floor is yours, welcome, and we uh, are looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone, depending on what part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about some of the more recent developments uh, that have uh, presented themselves regarding some of the medications and things that are um, under investigation, some of the new trial information that's come out. And um, I actually see one question already that we're going to cover right off the bat, and that's what's the mechanism of action for dexamethasone as it relates to COVID-19 treatment? So, Jeremiah, thank you for that question. We'll jump right in and get that answered for you. Um, so. Before we start talking about dexamethasone, it's important to understand a little bit about the some of the reason for some of the severe complications we see with COVID-19. And so uh, it turns out that actually one of the, actually probably the, the reason for some of the more severe symptoms are not necessarily due to the virus itself, but are in fact due to our immune system's response to the virus. And the reason we know that is because a, uh, a lot of studies have been on looking at levels of cytokines in patients' blood while they're experiencing moderate to severe symptoms of COVID-19, but uh, also on autopsy, so po post-mortem examinations. So this information first came out of China, but it's been confirmed many times over uh, in the post-mortems uh, that have been performed on patients who have passed away from COVID-19. And consistently what you find is uh, highly activated immune cells, and that really is pathology code for T cells um, for the most part in lung tissues uh, primarily, but also you can see it in heart tissue and other organs. And so uh, the postmortem results also confirm high levels of uh, highly activated immune cells, again, that's T cells, um, in the blood. So not only are they in the organs, they're in the blood, and what they're doing most likely is secreting high levels of cytokines uh, that activate other components of the immune system, and that again serves to further activate the immune system, and so you get this ramp up of the immune system. In general, we call that cytokine release syndrome, and uh, the phenomenon of cytokine release syndrome has been well described in COVID-19. So all of that, when you put that together, it's very consistent with uh, immune damage being observed in tissues, uh, in, particularly in the lung, but again also in other organs like the heart. And so um, we think that that's one of the primary drivers of the more moderate to severe symptoms in COVID-19, particularly the respiratory symptoms. So with that background, that may help explain a little bit why we're so interested in dexamethasone. Uh, next slide, please. So we recently learned um, on the news about uh, that there were some great results coming out about dexamethasone. And uh, two days ago, in fact, the actual data from that trial were published on um, MedRxIV, it's a, it's a pre-publication uh, place for people to post their non-peer-reviewed uh, article submissions. And so that's where this came from. And the, uh, the trial in question is the recovery trial. So the recovery trial was a randomized, controlled, open-label trial in a little under 6,500 patients. Um, and that was for the dexamethasone arm. You'll see we're gonna talk about the recovery trial again when it comes to hydroxychloroquine in, in a little bit. Um, but uh, that data comes from 176 hospitals in the United Kingdom. So the intervention that they used was dexameth excuse me, dexamethasone, six milligrams either uh, orally or intravenously, once a day for a maximum of 10 days as compared to standard of care. Uh, the randomization was one to two, so one patient, in, one patient in the treatment arm as compared to two patients in the control arm. So they had 2,100 patients in the dexamethasone arm, 4,300 patients in the standard of care arm. Uh, the patients were all hospitalized patients with clinically suspected or confirmed COVID-19. That's a little bit different. Almost all the other trials we've looked at have uh, only included patients who actually have laboratory confirmed COVID-19. That's kind of an interesting twist. Um, I don't know if that's due to limitations on testing in the UK, um, but um, something a little different than what we've seen before. Uh, it included, one interesting thing about this trial as well is that it included patients who were 
less than 18 years old, so we haven't seen a lot of pediatric studies, as well as women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. And again, that's a group that we've not really seen included in a lot of trials. So we're getting some interesting information out of this trial beyond just the results uh, about dexamethasone. Um, the exclusion criteria are listed for you there. The outcomes that they were looking at were primarily the uh, all-cause mortality. So they're looking at, regardless of what the cause of death was, uh, if you died within 28 days, that was one of the primary outcomes they were looking at. Secondarily, they were looking at time to discharge from the hospital, as well as progression to mechanical ventilation. Uh, next slide, please. So these, this is what we're all interested in, and this is what uh, has generated all the news. Uh, the 28-day mortality was significantly reduced in patients who received dexamethasone as compared to those who received standard of care. So here we see, uh, this is all groups, all comers, 21.6% mortality rate uh, at the 28-day mark in the dexamethasone arm as compared to 24.6% in the standard of care arm. And the risk ratio there was 0.83. The 95% confidence interval was 0.74 to 0.92. And remember when we talk about any type of a ratio, a hazard ratio, a risk ratio, relative risk, any of those types of things, the magic number we look for in the 95% confidence interval is one. So since the 95% confidence interval does not cross one, we know it's statistically significant. And just to drive home that point, they calculated a p-value for us and it was highly statistically significant. Now they also did a couple of subgroup analyses to see if there was different, if there was a, a bigger benefit or a smaller benefit in different groups. And a couple of the groups they looked at were patients who required mechanical ventilation as compared to those who required oxygen support, but not necessarily mechanical ventilation as compared to those who required no respiratory support at all. And they found that in patients who required invasive mechanical ventilation, there was an even greater benefit. Uh, dexamethasone reduced mortality by about a third. Uh, the relative, uh, the risk ratio there was 0.65 and the 95% confidence interval 0.51 uh, to 0.82. So again, highly statistically significant with the p-value of less than 0.01. So that's really significant. Uh, this is the first drug that's actually been shown to have a impact on mortality, particularly in patients who are severely ill or critically ill. Um, so that's very, very exciting news and good news for all of us. Um, in patients who required oxygen support, but not mechanical ventilation, there was also a benefit. It was a little bit smaller. Uh, it reduced the risk of mortality by 20% as compared to standard of care. And again, the risk ratio and 95% confidence interval are listed there for you. Um, interestingly, in patients who did not require respiratory support, so patients who probably had more in the mild to moderate category of disease, uh, there was no benefit to dexamethasone, at least in terms of 28-day uh, mortality. Uh, next slide, please. So for those of you who are visual, uh, this is a represent, visual representation, representation of that same data for you. Uh, the uh, black lines represent usual care and the red lines represent uh, dexamethasone. And so uh, the higher the line, the more people uh, have passed away. And so the goal is to have the line be as close to the bottom line as possible. So there you can see uh, in panel A, that's all participants, and there's a pretty clear separation almost immediately um, out to day 28. That separation remains. Uh, in the no oxygen arm, uh, interestingly enough, you see a flip where the dexamethasone arm actually had a higher mortality uh, than the usual care arm, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, the authors didn't go into that too much in their paper, but um, it was not statistically significant, so um, hard to draw solid conclusions from that, but I'm sure there will be a lot of speculation about what's going on with that. Uh, in panels C and D, again, that's the patients who required oxygen only as compared to patients who required invasive mechanical ventilation. And again, you can see a nice separation between those lines, starts early and is maintained throughout the time course of the study. Next slide, please. So that's dexamethasone. Again, first drug to have a significant impact on mortality in COVID-19. So that's great news for all of us. Also, dexamethasone is cheap and widely available or at least it was, it's probably on shortage now or soon will be, uh, as everybody in the world is trying to buy dexamethasone. Um, so moving on to hydroxychloroquine. Um, and this has been almost a soap opera, a science soap opera is what I like to call it. Um, when, you, when you look at hydroxychloroquine and all the data that's come out and been retracted and um, the emergency use authorizations that were granted, and now most recently, uh, on June 15th, the FDA revoked the emergency use authorization for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine uh, for COVID-19. 
And the FDA cited multiple reasons for doing this. Um, the first was that the dosing regimens that were proposed uh, in the emergency use authorization were actually unlikely to produce an antiviral effect. Um, so we won't go into this too, too much today, but when you look at the pharmacokinetics, uh, as well as the, the IC50s, the inhibitory concentration in, uh, in vitro, uh, it's, not, it's difficult to achieve some of those concentrations with some of the dosing regimens that were proposed. So they withdrew it from, for that reason. Um, also, in some of the really early reports about hydroxychloroquine, we all got excited because it looked like uh, hydroxychloroquine was able to decrease the time that uh, people shed the COVID-19 virus. And so that has not been consistently reproduced in randomized trials. And so they no longer think that that's accurate. Uh, also, current treatment guidelines, including the National Institutes of Health uh, treatment guidelines, do not recommend the use of hydroxychloroquine outside the setting of a clinical trial. So it's not part of standard of care. And most importantly, recent data from a large randomized controlled trial did not show a benefit uh, to hydroxychloroquine use. Uh, so next slide, please. So the data actually comes from the same trial we were talking about for dexamethasone. It's the recovery trial from the UK. So in the hydroxychloroquine group, um, in the, uh, I should say the hydroxychloroquine arm, uh, again, they used the same randomization schema, one patient to hydroxychloroquine to two control patients. They had just under 4,700 patients who enrolled in the trial. And uh, the intervention here was really pretty interesting. This is a, a pretty aggressive um, hydroxychloroquine dosing regimen, 2,400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine on day one. Uh, hydroxychloroquine has a very large volume of distribution, so they're trying to get levels up quickly, followed by 800 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine on days two through 10. And that was the intervention as compared to standard of care. So that's higher than most of the hydroxychloroquine dosing regimens that you'll see out there in a lot of the trials, and certainly higher than what was recommended in the emergency use authorization approved by the FDA. So here we had about 1,500 patients in the hydroxychloroquine arm and about 3,000 patients in the standard of, care, uh, standard of care arm. So patients were, again, same, same inclusion criteria as uh, previously mentioned, same exclusion criteria. Um, next slide, please. So what were the results? Now, uh, just so you're all aware, uh, this trial, this portion of the trial has not been published yet. So uh, all of this information actually comes from, directly from the, the FDA letter that is um, withdrawing the emergency use authorization uh, for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine for COVID-19. So uh, what a bizarre time where we're, we're, <laughs> we're getting scientific information uh, from regulatory uh, letters back and forth uh, and from non-peer-reviewed uh, articles, but that's the, the world we live in with COVID-19, where we're all trying to get as much information as quickly as we can. So um, the letter's there for you. I've got a link down there for you if you wanna actually check out the letter and read through some of the science um, yourselves. Uh, but the high-level overview, the uh, mortality, when you look at the 28-day mortality, was 25.7% in the hydroxychloroquine room, uh, arm as compared to 23.5% in the standard of care arm. So um, this was not statistically significant, but a trend towards patients actually doing worse in the hydroxychloroquine arm. And again, there's a lot of speculation as to why that might be. Um, the 95% confidence interval is there for you. Again, when we're talking about ratios, hazard ratio in this case, it clearly crosses one, so we know it's not statistically significant, and the p-value there also confirms that at 0 0.1. Um, additionally, they also looked at some secondary outcomes, looking at hospital length of stay, as well as need for mechanical ventilation, and it did not appear that hydroxychloroquine provided any benefit with regard to reducing length of stay or reducing the need for mechanical ventilation. Next slide, please. So that's hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of COVID-19. And we also had another study come out that looked at hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is interesting. A lot of people have been um, using the idea of either pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis and uh, looking if there are medications that may be beneficial in either of those scenarios. So we finally have some high quality data looking at post-exposure prophylaxis. So this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in 821 patients with household or occupational exposure to someone with confirmed COVID-19. And you'll see they broke those down into a, a high-risk and a, an intermediate-risk group. So there were 400 patients, uh, 414 patients in the hydroxychloroquine arm, 
and 407 patients in the placebo arm. Uh, the intervention here was hydroxychloroquine, 1,400 milligrams a day on day one, followed by 600 milligrams a day on days two through five. So when you compare that to the regimen we talked about in the previous trial, um, it kind of gives you a sense of how high that previous trial was. That really is about the highest hydroxychloroquine dosing regimen I've seen anywhere. So this one is a little bit lower. So uh, the patients in this study were patient, uh, people who were at least 18 years old or older who had household or occupational exposure to a person con with confirmed COVID-19 at a distance of less than six feet for more than 10 minutes. So we're, we're adding on some qualifiers there. So this is definitely you know, significant exposure. And they broke that down into two groups. Uh, if this exposure happened while people were not wearing any personal protective equipment, that was considered a high risk exposure. And if it occurred while uh, someone was wearing a face mask, but not an eye shield, that was considered an intermediate risk exposure. So as you might imagine, there were a significant number of healthcare providers included um, in this group. So um, that's at least who our patient population is. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a look at the results. Um, so high level overview, it turns out that hydroxychloroquine did not provide any benefit in terms of preventing uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. So uh, in the hydroxychloroquine arm, 49 out of 414 patients, or about 12%, uh, ended up contracting COVID-19 during the study period, as compared to 58 of 407 patients in the placebo arm. Uh, so it looks, at least if you look at the percentages, it appears as if there's a potential benefit to hydroxychloroquine, but because of the relatively small numbers of patients in this study, uh, that value was not statistically significant and very much so at uh, 0.035 p-value there. Uh, they did report out on some safety findings. There were no reported arrhythmias or deaths that occurred. And so um, that's always a concern, especially lately um, with all the increased focus on the cardiac um, impact of uh, hydroxychloroquine in particular. Now, um, they did report that there was a statistically significant difference in adherence between the two arms. So um, the hydroxychloroquine arm was less adherent than the placebo arm. 75% adherence in the hydroxychloroquine arm versus 82.6% in the placebo arm. That was, again, statistically significant. And the reason for that was because of side effects. Uh, side effects were cited as the most common reason for noncompliance. And about 40% of patients in the hydroxychloroquine group reported side effects as compared to uh, just under 17% in the patients who received placebo. And the side effects that were reported most frequently were nausea, loose stools, and abdominal discomfort. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we now have some good answers about hydroxychloroquine. We know it doesn't work to treat COVID-19. We've got some pretty solid data there. We also know it's not beneficial for um, post-exposure prophylaxis. So it looks like um, hydroxychloroquine is not the wonder drug we were hoping it was at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, moving on to another topic that we get a lot of questions about here at APHA, and I know that means that you get a lot of questions about this as well in your pharmacies, is nutritional supplements. Are there any, is there any benefit to nutritional supplements for COVID-19? And the most common supplements that we get questions about are vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and selenium in particular. So um, rather than go into each of these individually, just for the sake of time, I'll summarize it. Um, I, I did a PubMed search actually just this morning just to confirm that nothing had come up overnight. Uh, and to date, there's no evidence from well-designed trials that demonstrates any benefit of any of the nutritional supplements listed above. Um, there are some case reports here and there. They're pretty sporadic, and a lot of them don't really provide enough detail to really uh, even suggest that there's a strong relationship between the supplements and outcomes. And even if they did, again, they're case reports. So uh, outside of the setting of a controlled trial, really those are hypothesis generating only. So um, the only study, the hot, high quality study that I know of is a trial of um, intravenous high dose vitamin C that's ongoing. I believe that's being done in China. And results, unfortunately, are not expected from that trial until September of this year. So we've got three or four more months to go before we see any of that data to see if it had any benefit. So. Um, high level summary, all the data on nutritional supplements at this point are anecdotal at best. And as I mentioned earlier, really should be used for hypothesis generation only. So um, if your patients ask you, the answer is there's no benefit, uh, there's no evidence of benefit uh, that we know of. 
Um, there's also no evidence of harm that we know of because of the lack of quality data. So Michael, I will kick it back over to you. Well, that's great. It's good information and uh, appreciate you bringing us up to speed on these uh, clinical topics with the drug therapies. Uh, to engage our audience and some participation here, I'm going to do a polling question. Let's do this first polling question. Have you seen a change in hydroxychloroquine prescribing patterns since the emergency use authorization was withdrawn? Uh, just click on your screen there, yes you have, no you haven't, or it's not applicable to your practice because you don't dispense hydroxychloroquine. So uh, just uh, like to get a pulse of the audience and see what your experiences has been, have been since uh, hydroxychloroquine's emergency use authorization has been withdrawn. All right, just give it a couple more seconds here to let everybody who wants to vote have the chance to do so. Okay, let's close out our poll. And it looks like, yes, there may be some uh, changes happening uh, to those who are working in uh, areas dispensing hydroxychloroquine. There's been some shift in the use of the drug since that uh, uh, change has taken place with the, uh, with the EUA. Well, I want to uh, kind of get to a few of our questions now from our audience. And um, I think my first question is one that uh, is uh, the, our listener, Allison Toole, does not have audio. So I'm going to ask this question on her behalf, uh, Dan. Uh, uh, dexamethasone, um, so, so given your presentation, she's interpreting that dexamethasone in outpatient COVID care really is not something we should be seeing. Is that correct? Is that a correct interpretation? Dan, we can't hear you. I think your audio is muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, for, for the most part, I think that's probably accurate. Um, there may be a rare circumstance where for some reason someone is in an ambulatory clinic or an outpatient setting and they are placed on supplemental oxygen and told to come back to the hospital if their symptoms worsen. That, keep in mind, there was some benefit to patients who required oxygen supplementation, but not mechanical ventilation. For the most part, I would say most of those patients are going to be in the hospital, but on the unusual circumstance where someone like that was an outpatient, that might be the one exception where you might see some outpatient use of dexamethasone. Okay. Great. Okay, um, staff, would you please unmute the line of Tracy Tolf, T-O-L-F, Tracy Tolf. Tracy, we're going to unmute your line and let you ask your question about N-acetylcysteine. Um, so I was wondering, I'm a fourth year pharmacy student on my APPE rotation, um, and I was wondering if there's any evidence for using the N-acetyl-L-cysteine as a prevention. Dan, go ahead. Tracy, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, there have been a few case reports that I've seen uh, talking about the use of acetylcysteine, uh, and really that's about all there is, is case reports. Um, to my knowledge, there are no well-designed trials that answer that question, um, and the case reports that I read were sort of indifferent in terms of the um, potential benefit that they found in the cases, uh, and so, um, Data is, at this point, very much uh, anecdotal and uh, hypothesis generating. Good. Thank you, Dan, for that answer, and Tracy, for that question. Uh, David Mattingly, you have a question uh, about uh, contact, and I think maybe I can help with this one. But uh, David, please, uh, we'll unmute your line now, and you can ask your question. Uh, I have a, a coworker that his significant other was around a person that tested positive for COVID. He came into work and then told everybody, what action should I be taking? That is a fantastic question, David. And uh, here at the at Loma Linda University Health, we get that question almost every day. So I'm glad you've asked the question because it's a very common question. You know, pharmacists are considered healthcare workers, and when you look at the CDC's guidance on essential healthcare workers, it's a little bit different than their guidance for the general public. Uh, and in that circumstance, what the CDC says is that you need to have 
uh, personal contact, the healthcare worker's contact has to be uh, within six feet and sustained for 15 minutes or longer, and then without a mask and so forth, with no personal protective equipment. Um, your coworker, because your coworker was not directly exposed to the person with COVID-19, under CDC recommendations, can continue to work. They need to obviously uh, adhere to all personal protective equipment guidelines that healthcare workers need to adhere to, which means masking uh, during their work shift, and of course, monitoring themselves for signs and symptoms of COVID daily, and all healthcare professionals should be doing that. But in the case of your coworker in the scenario you've uh, presented, uh, at this point in time, CDC would not have that person necessarily do anything different other than continue about their, their normal course of action since they did not have the direct contact. Um, I wonder if uh, uh, we could get Mitch Rothholtz uh, and uh, Elisa Bernstein to also join by video uh, if possible. And, uh, and Mitch, I know you stay up on the CDC's guidelines pretty well. Uh, did, is there anything I missed on that or, or uh, anything you'd like to add? No, I think, Michael, you captured it correctly. Um, the guidance you gave is, you know, again, use personal protection, uh, but again, since you didn't have direct contact, you should be okay. Okay, great. Okay, uh, we're going to unmute the line of uh, Murdy Savitala. Uh, Dr. Savitala has a question for Dan Zlot on uh, Fapinavir. Uh, excuse my pronunciation. <laughs> okay, Marty Savitala, please ask your question. <laughs> Dan, what are your thoughts on this Fapinavir, the new drug, or the drug uh, Gilead, or somebody's making? I know it's being marketed in India from what I heard so far. Murdy, thank you, great question. So this has been interesting. I've been watching this one pretty closely. Um, early on, there was a lot of interest in this drug and um, really haven't seen a whole lot of clinical data come out about it so far. Um, and I'm not sure if um, there's data available, but um, maybe it's submitted to regulatory agencies, but we haven't seen it yet. So. Um, to date, I really don't have a whole lot of information one way or the other about um, papinavir. I need to unmute my line now. I did the same thing. I apologize for that. Okay, I'm going to take some questions that we received from our listeners uh, in advance of the webinar. Clinical questions, Dan, uh, they're on a variety of topics. So uh, I apologize in advance to you for peppering you with a wide range of topics, but these are the things our listeners want to hear about. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk about, and I've heard this question many times before, but uh, don't know the answer myself. So maybe you can help enlighten all of us here. Is there any issues with using metformin in patients who have COVID? Um, this uh, uh, listener today had a patient who was released from the hospital and had been told by their uh, hospitalist not to take metformin. In fact, they had switched the patient to insulin therapy. So can you talk to us a little bit about metformin and what, what are the issues with COVID? Sure. So directly, there's no issue that I'm aware of. Um, when you look at the literature, um, there's a lot of speculation um, that that, COVID, uh, that actually metformin may even have some benefit for COVID-19. I don't take, I don't put much stock in that. There's been a lot of speculation that almost everything may have some benefit uh, for COVID-19. But um, the reason I suspect, and this is just speculation, that that patient was advised to or switched off of metformin, when patients are in the hospital, one of the scary things about COVID-19 is you never quite know the course they're gonna take until they're all the way better. Um, and even then, there's some, some instances where people get worse after being discharged. It's relatively rare, but it does happen. So as patients uh, progress, you can go into multi-system organ failure, including renal failure. And so obviously metformin uh, with kidney failure is not a good combination because of lactic acidosis. And when you add on top of that, the fact that uh, most patients will also have some respiratory compromise. And so their ability to maintain acid base status is already compromised from the respiratory uh, dysfunction. So you add respiratory failure and kidney failure, and that's a really nasty combination. So uh, when patients are coming into the hospital with COVID-19, that may be why some people, uh, some hospitalists are electing proactively to take people off of their metformin until they know how they're going to do 
just to avoid any of those potential um, implications. Great, great. That's very, very insightful. Uh, speaking of chronic medications uh, that we see in the patient population, uh, Singular, uh, I believe that's Montelukast, has uh, uh, been uh, mentioned some recently about uh, potentially using it uh, in COVID because there were some studies actually going back to Zika virus that maybe this medicine uh, impacted the envelope of the virus. And so it sounds a little similar. Can you speak to uh, any promise that maybe Singular has for that purpose as well? Sure. Um, I have not seen uh, really any, again, data around Singular um, that um, it provides any benefit. And when you talk about uh, Montelukast in COVID-19 in particular, there might actually be some, some dual interest there. A, if it you know, somehow disrupts the viral replication or the viral um, uh, coding or something like that, that, that could potentially be of interest. But given what we talked about with the immune reactions, uh, the fact that Montelukast is a leukotriene modifier, leukotrienes are, of course, um, immune potentiators. They increase immune reactions. And so um, the ability to decrease inflammation may also be of interest. Um, but I have not seen any data other than a couple of anecdotal case reports. So uh, no high quality data. So it's impossible to make a judgment at this point. Yeah. And one thing I might remind our listeners of as well is that uh, clinicaltrials.gov is actually a great place to go. You can search for uh, all of the registered trials that academic institutions, even globally, uh, submit and register. And, and you can see which of those trials are ongoing, if they're, in, if they're enrolling patients or not enrolling patients. Uh, and where they are with their with their studies. So uh, it's a great resource. And I know uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I went on uh, to just search COVID-19 studies. And I think there were just over 500 that were listed, uh, different studies looking at everything from vaccines to prevention to treatment. And there were things that were from lots of different countries in the world, um, including the U.S., of course. But uh, that's another resource. Uh, Dan, any other resources out there that you think pharmacists should be aware of or clinicaltrials.gov, probably the best source? Uh, clinical trials is probably the most comprehensive source for ongoing clinical trials. And then uh, the probably the two most reliable databases for medical literature, if you want to take a look at the literature yourself, are, of course, PubMed. That's always my first place to go to. If you happen to work at an institution or for a company that has access to Embase, uh, that's also um, pretty useful. So those are kind of my two go-tos. Um, and then... Um, on occasion, uh, Dr. Google, um, as always, you, you find some interesting stuff there that's not necessarily listed on PubMed. So for example, in today's talk, I listed a paper from the uh, MedRxIV. That's not uh, indexed in PubMed. So anytime you have a journal or an article posted there, uh, you either have to get to it from an, another article that's linked to it or from Google. So um, it as much as we discourage students from using Google as the primary source of their medical literature, it does have a role in today's age with as much information as coming out about COVID-19. Yeah, and of course, we got to check those primary sources. I know we have a lot of students listening on the line today. So, uh, and speaking of students, we've got a pharmacy student who has a question. Uh, uh, Savannah uh, Abulian, I believe is how you pronounce the name. Uh, we're unmuting your line and we'll let you ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, please. Uh, hi, thank you for this webinar, it's really helpful. Uh, like I said, I'm a pharmacy student and I'm working in a retail pharmacy. I do have young children, three kids, and I'm like in the beginning, I was very panicky when I was working. We do have patients come to our pharmacy and every time I come home, I alcohol, everything, spray alcohol with all my bags, my glasses, everything. So I a little bit, I'm better now, I, I now that time passes, but I was wondering if I'm doing the right thing, should I do it or I'm over panicking <laughs> or what is the better uh, do things to do? Thank you. Uh, great, thank you for that question. Dan, this is a great question because there's been a lot of information recently on uh, COVID-19 transmissibility on as on fomites on on inanimate objects. Can you speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. So um, early on, uh, there were some studies that showed that uh, COVID-19 lived on objects for a long time, 
and uh, there was a lot of concern that um, the it was highly likely to be able to pick up COVID-19 from objects. Um, over time, we've learned that it's less transmissible uh, via surfaces than we thought originally. That's not to say it can't be transmitted that way, but you're less likely to uh, transmit or pick up COVID-19 that way, um, probably due to the, the, the dose of virus that you can actually pick up that way. Um, but with regard to your question about is alcohol effective, absolutely alcohol is effective. Um, that's why we're using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and that seems to be effective for cleaning our hands. Um, the key thing with alcohol is to use enough uh, alcohol to ensure that you uh, have a maintain you maintain a enough contact time with alcohol. So that's usually on the order of probably five to ten seconds minimum, and then make sure it evaporates completely. It's that evaporation that actually ends up killing uh, a lot of bacteria and viruses by essentially dehydrating them. Um, and then of course washing your clothes again. Soap and water are incredibly effective uh, against. Uh, all microorganisms or most microorganisms. And so washing your clothes uh, also should be effective. Well, that's good information as well. <clears throat> and as we all know, uh, as we as the COVID crisis continues and uh, weeks go by, we learn more and more about this virus. Some things that we had originally assumed about this virus and thought were true, we've learned later were not true. And, and then we've learned new things that we didn't know about as, as things go on. And so I think it does make uh, this particular crisis that we're encountering something that we really got to stay on top of as pharmacists, uh, healthcare providers, uh, not only for our patient's health, but for our uh, personal well-being as well. We have to be paying attention to these things. Now, Dan, I got another clinical question that came in before the show from one of our uh, listeners. Uh, can aspirin be used as prophylactic treatment for blood clots uh, that we're seeing in COVID-19? So we see this state of hypercoagulability with patients who have COVID-19 infection. Um, so, you know, is it kind of, could, could, does an aspirin a day keep the COVID away, Dan? I guess that's the question. <laughs> that's a, a great question. Um, so I'll answer the first one. Uh, does, does aspirin prevent COVID-19 infection? The answer to that one is no, not that we know of. Um, <laughs> the second question is, uh, does aspirin prevent uh, the hypercoagulability or can it counteract the hypercoagulability that seems to be present with COVID-19? The answer is we really don't know just yet. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at anticoagulation in COVID-19 patients, and the best available data right now are in patients who are receiving, receiving either heparin or low molecular weight heparins. So uh, both heparin and low molecular weight heparins have been shown to uh, decrease, to improve outcomes in patients who um, are hospitalized with COVID-19. So uh, that's about as far as I would go. So in terms of anticoagulation, aspirin to be determined, um, don't have solid evidence there, um, but definitely heparin and low molecular heparin in hospitalized patients. Okay, well, that's, a, that's good information uh, as well. Um, let's change the patient here, um, or the question here to a different patient type. Uh, you talked about um, the high dose IV vitamin C therapy um, and uh, uh, and you mentioned that that trial is ongoing, um, but I don't remember you mentioning whether or not there are any preliminary results from that. Do you have any insights on that yet? I mean, has there been any kind of indicators from that as to what we expect might happen with it? Or, or are we really just kind of in the dark at this point? Yeah, so far uh, we're pretty much in the dark. Uh, there's not been any um, interim analysis that I've seen. Um, so just quickly, I'll take a, a little side detour and just talk about why people are interested in vitamin C. Um, vitamin C, of course, is an antioxidant. And so with all of the inflammation caused by COVID-19, there's a lot of thought that providing an anti-inflammatory, or in this case, um, an antioxidant may help with the uh, oxidative stress in the system and maybe improve outcomes. So I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much interest in vitamin C. Um, but unfortunately, that's all hypothetical and uh, no, no early results yet to uh, get a sneak peek at the outcomes. But is there anything we need to worry about? I mean, I, I have, as I'm sure all pharmacists have seen, patients uh, take 
pretty high doses of uh, uh, over-the-counter vitamin C supplements um, during flu season and cold to, to, to ward off coughs and colds and so forth and so on. I mean, is there a risk here or is it, or, or are we, you know, does it matter one way or the other? If, an, if, a, if a patient wants to take high dose vitamin C over the counter, do they need to be worried about any harms associated with that? Yeah, absolutely. There, um, as with everything, there are risks. Um, the, you know, maximum dose of vitamin C is relatively high and you can take a fair amount of it. However, um, one of the risks, of course, is kidney stones. Um, you can, you can, basically uh, cause kidney stones if you take high dose vitamin C, either extremely high doses or um, higher doses for an extended period of time. The trial that's going on in China is using very high doses, 24 grams a day uh, intravenously, I believe. Um, but again, that's in a monitored setting. And so we obviously wouldn't recommend that in an outpatient setting. Um, also in, in rare occasions, keep in mind vitamin C is an acid. And so if you take a whole bunch of vitamin C and you have some underlying kidney dysfunction or some underlying respiratory dysfunction, you may develop some acid base issues as well. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're going to take one more question here from a listener, uh, Catherine Russo. Uh, Catherine Russo, we will, let, we will take your question. So I'm an Abbey student at St. John's University. Uh, so my question is in regards to vaccines. Is there any data that would suggest coronavirus virus can mutate seasonally like influenza, which would require a yearly vaccine? Hmm. That's a really great question. Um, I, I can give you a partial response to that. I wonder if Dan wants to take the first stab at it. Sure. Um, so, Catherine, great question. Um, there, there is some evidence that um, there's some mutation that we're seeing with coronavirus. Um, and in fact, in different areas of the country, you see certain strains um, that are more prevalent than in other areas of the country. However, the mutation rate does not seem to be quite as high as we see with the influenza vaccine. And so um, whether or not we'll need it yearly, I think is still to be determined. Um, but the antigenic shift that you see with uh, the flu virus has not been as widely observed with the coronavirus to date. And that's not to say it couldn't happen um, with the right set of mutations. You might get into that. Um, that antigenic shift at a much higher frequency, and that might require more frequent uh, vaccines. Michael, anything to add? Yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's a great question, and really embedded in that question are really two things. One is what's the what are the characteristics of the virus, and uh, the vaccines that are under development are those vaccines. Uh, targeting components of coronavirus that would not matter uh, for, uh, relative to mutations, or are they targeting components of the virus, such as, for example, outer surface proteins or so forth, that might have the capability of mutating. And so I think that's really uh, part of it. I can tell you that there are a host of different vaccine candidates under development that cover a broad range of the mechanistic uh, 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 components of, of, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so, um, you know, we won't know the answer to that question in terms of whether or not we'll have to routinely vaccinate. It could be different depending on which vaccine is utilized in the patient because we will have multiple vaccines likely make it to the marketplace. And so that's something we'll have to look out for. But the second component to your question is that we won't know probably for quite a long time what the longevity of the immune response will be to COVID vaccine. So um, in terms of whether we have to be vaccinated annually or every two years or every five years or once in a lifetime, we're really not gonna know until the vaccine comes to market and we get large enough numbers of people who've received the vaccine and whose antibody titers we can monitor and, and whose infection rates we can monitor following vaccination. So unfortunately, the answer to your question is going to be years in the making because it's going to take us quite some time to be able to really get to the bottom of that question. So very, very important. Okay. 
Uh, we have reached the end of our Q&A period, and for those of you who uh, are uh, uh, have additional questions that haven't been asked or haven't been answered, uh, we will do our best over the course of the next week to answer your questions through uh, our other communication vehicles on pharmacist.com, including our COVID-19 Engage community. Uh, but with that, I'm going to uh, now turn to Dan to share with us uh, information from uh, APHA's current and ongoing activities, especially in the area of the education department. All right. So thank you, Michael. Um, for those of you who haven't seen our 15 on COVID-19 series, I would definitely encourage you to check that out. There are short 15 to 20 minute CE sessions designed to help you separate fact from fiction, uh, review some of the literature with a critical eye um, and help you just answer questions that you're getting from your patients. So we've got a couple of uh, recent episodes for you, one on the recent uh, randomized controlled trial data for remdesivir, and another one where we actually had a great guest host, Sandra Leal, who's uh, president-elect of APHA on telehealth. And if you don't know Sandra, she is one of, one of, if not the most knowledgeable pharmacists on the topic of telehealth. So that was a real treat to have her uh, guest host for us. So um, very excited about that. And so with that, um, next slide, please. And I will turn that over to Elisa or Michael. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, Elisa, we want Elisa Bernstein to tell us about what's going on in the regulatory uh, and advocacy space at APHA. Elisa? Great, thank you. Um, so we just also want to remind you that we have a number of practice resources that contain information for, um, about COVID and pharmacy practice. And these are all available on the Pharmacist Guide to Coronavirus, which if you go to pharmacist.com, you can access it immediately. And here are uh, just an example of co a couple of the um, resources that are appropriate and um, related to what you ta we talked about here, what Dan talked about. So on the next slide, please, thanks. I'm going to give you a brief update on how APHA has been advocating for you. Uh, in the last week, we were really busy meeting with uh, regulators. On Monday, APHA, NASPA, and other national pharmacy organizations met with CMS to discuss Medicaid issues that related to pharmacies and pharmacists offering COVID-19 point-of-care testing. Um, and vaccines when a vaccine is available. We advocated and expressed that every healthcare provider who can test, treat, and vaccinate should be utilized, and that it's an, an important part of that is a sustainable access to payment for pharmacists. And the meeting went well. We had an open, engaging discussion, and CMS alluded to a guidance that they may be issuing shortly that would address pharmacist testing under Medicaid to help states and reduce the barriers for pharmacists to provide services during the emergency response. Um, and we also advocated to that pharmacists should be treated equally in payment for services provided. So we'll update you when CMS provides additional information on the, from this meeting. The next slide, we also this week met with FDA, uh, also on Monday, um, APHA met um, at FDA at a listening session on drug compounding that was held virtually. We reached out and worked with the um, APHA APPM compounding SIG, Special Industry Group, and got feedback from them. And we communicated comments and concerns from um, our compounding members. Um, and in particular, we asked FDA to maintain and expand the new flexibilities that they've been providing during the pandemic and um, that have been used that could ease current and future drug shortages. So uh, among other things, we urge FDA to continue to leverage the flexibility that the agency granted for pharmacists to compound medications in shortage under 503A and 503B for hospitalized patients without a patient-specific prescription. Um, and so there's more that we said um, and talked about, and a copy of our statement is also available on our website. The next slide, please. You know, there continues to be questions surrounding the accuracy and utility of serology or antibody tests. 
and FDA continues to move to remove unproven tests from the market and recently issued a number of warning letters to marketers of unproven tests. And they also alerted healthcare providers to look at their list of antibody tests that were removed from the market. And this remove test list, so they created this remove test list. And this list includes tests where significant clinical performance problems were identified that cannot be or have not been addressed by the commercial manufacturer to FDA in a timely manner. So we're hearing a lot about of, of that, that validity ver um, and the accuracy of the test. So FDA re recommends that um, labs, it, which would include pharmacies that, that do testing, to check the removed test list um, and and uh, there are a number of other recommendations on that web page. So um, I encourage you, if you're thinking about doing antibody testing, if you have questions about an antibody testing or which tests to use, um, this is a really good web page to go to and, co and continue to go back to. The next slide. You know, in the coming weeks, Congress is expected to craft further emergency legislation to address the COVID-19 pan pandemic. We've asked you uh, almost every week um, to help in this fight and go to APHA's Act Action Center um, in order to let your congressman and legislator know um, that, that, that pharmacists sh uh, and sh pharmacists should be recognized as healthcare providers in the next legislative package and um, authorized by Medicare to be paid for testing patients for COVID-19 and influenza. If you go to this website, fill in the, the information in the Take Action Now section and just click. Um, that will help you in one easy click to send letters to your appropriate legislators. So um, please help in this fight. And we need, we really need a strong show of support in order to get this legislation across the finish line. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Elisa. And thank you all for listening. I do want to encourage all of you to post on Engage, uh, APHA's platform for members to be able to uh, discuss pertinent and relevant topics. There's been some great conversation on the Engage platform about both COVID-19 and all the affiliated and related topics uh, for caring for our patients. So I'd encourage you to be involved in that. I also want to encourage all of us as pharmacists to advocate within our profession, with our fellow pharmacists and pharmacy technicians and student pharmacists to join and be a member of APHA. Uh, these webinars are provided free of charge and as a service to the profession of pharmacy, but we need all of you to be in the game and a part of these dialogues and supporting the profession that's supporting you. In addition, we encourage you strongly to become a member of your state pharmacy association if you're not already, as the state pharmacy associations are fighting for the authorities that have been discussed here at the state level. Now, next week, we're going to take a break from our weekly webinar because it is uh, the uh, beginning of July and the holiday weekend, Independence Day <coughs> holiday weekend is upon us. And so we will take a break and we will come back uh, with our COVID-19 webinar beginning on Thursday, July the 9th at the same time and same place. Thank you to each of you for all that you do in support of your patients and your communities and our profession. Have a great day and God bless.